Um, so thank you very much, everyone, uh, for joining the last um, of the Arable Conversations for Arable Scotland 2021. Um, obviously, we normally like to conduct these in the field, but due to the um, ongoing pandemic, uh, we're having to do this online again for the second year in a row. Um, but hopefully it's going to allow us to engage with a few more people from further afield. So without much further ado, I'm just going to start with some housekeeping. Um, so just to let everyone know um, that the session is being recorded. Um, and also, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask the panel or also if you'd like to ask a wider audience, um, if you click on the, or if you see on the right hand side, um, if you look on the right hand side, you'll see something that says Q and A. So you can ask your questions there. And there's another tab that says chat, uh, which gives you the opportunity to chat with um, everyone. And you can see there, if you click on the chat now, you can see there's a link there for feedback. And also, once you've completed the feedback, you can get your um, basis and, and Rosso points. So. Um, at the end of the session, you get the feedback and then you can claim your points. So, first of all, good evening. Welcome. Um, sorry to be dragging you away from a very important game of football, which is England against um, Germany, um, if you care. Um, but we're going to be talking about um, net zero, making carbon pay. And it's great to have on the panel David Aglan from Balburnie Home Farms, uh, Matt Ward, who's an agronomist uh, for Hutchinson's or Pharmacy. Um and Matt Aikenhead, who's a carbon modeler. Um, it's also great to welcome Duncan Farrington, um, who is from Bottom Farm, and they're actually being accredited um, effectively net zero um, by the UN in 2020. Uh, so it's great to uh, welcome Duncan. Um, I'll bring Duncan into the conversation um, as we go through, um, and he will be able to give some first-hand experience of how he's actually achieved that. Um, well ahead of the guidelines or the targets that have been set, certainly within Scotland. Um, so to start with, we'll just allow the panellists just to give a quick introduction of their interest in the topic and also where they're coming from. So if we could start with you, David, uh, just a brief introduction. Thank you. Thanks, oh, thanks Ken. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, yes, as Ken said, the manager at Balburnie Home Farms in Fife. Um, we have we are the strategic farm for HDB uh, for seals and oil seeds in Scotland, which started last year, runs for another six years. Uh, part of that project has been a carbon audit done of the, the whole business, um, and so we've got numbers to to start with, um, and we are very much interested in sequestering carbon into the soil using our livestock. We're lucky enough to have an awful lot of trees uh, on the estate, which, according to the carbon audit, are a big help to us. Um, and we're looking into regenerative agriculture and, again, trying to plant our crops in a fashion that, that allows us to sequester carbon into the soil. Um, and to me, carbon is... You could balance carbon with money. If you're, you're buying in carbon, you're spending cash. If you're putting carbon into the soil, you're putting it into your bank account, you're saving cash. Uh, in my mind. So if we look at it in that way, then maybe we can make more sense of it, perhaps. That's great. Thanks very much, David. And we might come back to a couple of the points that you um, put forward there um, later on. Um, Matt, if you'd like to um, introduce yourself as well now. Thank you. Sorry, Matt Ward. Matt Aikenhead has now joined us now. So we'll start with Matt Ward. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, um, Ken. Um, Matt Ward, I'm agronomist and uh, services leader for pharmacy in uh, East Midlands um, and uh, have had a uh, background in farm management, farm management consultancy and, uh, and all through my career in agronomy uh, and integrated crop management. Um, and my interests really have come from that background in a more holistic uh, view of farm and crop management rather than a specific um, uh, identifier of a specific uh, weed or fungicide pro fungal problem. Um, and um, my interest in carbon more latterly has been developing a means that we as a business have been able to measure soil carbon, uh, map it, uh, and then help growers make sense of that information and how they might then use that um, 
going forward in management planning. That's great. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, Matt Aikenhead now, if you'd like to um, say a bit about yourself. Or not, Matt. We don't seem to have you on audio at the moment. Um, okay, so we'll go back to one of the things that David spoke about. Um, and it's quite interesting. So, David, you started off by saying, okay, carbon in the soil is what the most important thing that you see um, on the farm. But I am going to contest that, that it's, is it the most important? Because, okay, if we look to the future um, and we'll say that subsidies might be based on increasing soil carbon, um, I suppose I would question whether that is possible on every farm, on every soil type. Uh, yes, um, I... I'm not coming at carbon quite from the point of view of being important from a subsidy point of view, potentially, you know, with the farming regime in the future. I'm going at it from an agronomic point of view. In other words, carbon in the soil provides so much benefits to soil life. Um, it, it's, you know, part of the humus and the organic matter in the soil that stores so much of the nutrition that a lot of our soils are are we're reduce, that that quantity is reducing over time because we've taken a lot of carbon out of our soils over the years. Uh, I fully agree that it won't be possible on all farms. We've we've had some analysis done this year um, in trial fields, and we've got um, organic matters ranging from four percent to nine percent. Um, now I don't know whether nine percent was a particularly peaty area. Of, of a field and the four percent was a sandy area that just happened to get into the sample of uh, for another field so anecdotally i would say that the better performing fields tend to have higher organic matter but we haven't been able to tie that down into statistics or fact yet um so that would be where i'm coming from from an agronom agronomic point of view um more carbon in the soil improves soil structure increases water holding capacity when it's dry so we can we can use more of the water that lands on the soil and it also absorbs more of the water when it's wet so that we don't get so much runoff um, as well so there's loads of benefits to that that i see at a basic level i agree that there are significant benefits with increasing soil carbon um but again it, it's again it's another interesting one is what the threshold is for your type of soil as well um maybe this is a good point to bring in matt uh ward when you were talking about um what you're doing of uh, measuring soil carbon um across the field so what's your been what is your been your experiences in looking at variability potentially of carbon across the field uh well, as you might expect, because it's not a homogenous substrate, um, that the variation it can be huge, um, and um, you know, I think what you were alluding to is that our, my view particularly, has been that unless I know my starting position, actually, what's more important is where I then, where I am in that from that position. So I can do all the management I like if I'm on a very light, sandy soil. Uh, if I've been doing a lot of sort of regenerative, for want of a better description, um, approaches, there's probably not a lot more I can do to build soil carbon. That doesn't stop me from thinking about how I manage carbon. That's, but, but it means that I can't keep increasing. It's not an... It's not an, uh, an infinite curve. Okay. So th that's exactly it, isn't it? It isn't an infinite curve. Um, Matt Aikenhead, are you able to share audio now? We'll see if... Can you hear me? Perfect. Yes. So, Matt, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Excellent. I'm very sorry. For the guy that's supposed to be the tech savvy one, this happens way more than it should. Right. So, yes, I'm Matt Aikenhead. I work at the James Hutton Institute up in Aberdeen. Um, I'm the lead of the Geoinformatics Group. Um, we do a lot of mapping and data analysis and uh, soils work particularly. So we have a, a large archive of soil maps in the Institute. Um, but over the years, we've been converting those into digital maps and putting them online. 
We've also been generating new maps of soils. And one of the things that we map a lot of is soil carbon. So a lot of my work has been looking at peat bogs. And the main interest there is to try and identify not only where is the peat, but how much carbon is there in the peat bogs? How deep is it? And what condition is it on the surface? Are there erosion features? Are there is there degradation? And also, is the cut is the peat emitting or absorbing carbon from the atmosphere? So that's that's peat bog stuff. But for for more standard agricultural land, we're also trying to work out how we can better understand the the potential of the soil for storing uh, soil carbon. Now, the the main challenge we have there is to actually validate whether or not someone's management is changing the soil carbon stocks because it's a very slow process. So given the the time involved, you very often can't pick up on a, a change in the soil carbon over a period of any less than three to five years. And so what we're doing is trying to find methods where you can more rapidly assess the changes and also to rapidly identify the variability of soil carbon stocks across a farm or even across a single field. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, I'm now delighted to say that Alison Milne has joined us. Um, I didn't actually introduce Alison as being on the panel because I was aware that she was having some internet issues um, getting connected. So welcome, Alison. So Alison's from Demston Farm. Um, and also Crafty Maltsters, but has also been involved in some of the groups um, that have engaged with Scottish Government. So, Alison, um, we'll, we'll see if this works. If you could take yourself off on mute and then just add a little bit more about yourself and also where you're coming from. Um, I can unmute you if that might be easier. Right, in theory. Oh. No, I think we're going to miss Alison again. Okay. Hopefully, we'll see if Alison can join in with audio in a bit. Sorry, I'm staring at the screen. <laughs> no, okay. Right. We'll maybe come back to that. Um, so, obviously, um, soil carbon isn't everything. So, the, the broader topic is when we're talking about net zero. And I suppose now it might be a good point to bring in Duncan to actually... Uh, share your experiences. But before we do that, what I think it would be quite useful to do is actually do one of the polls. So I'm hoping um, that uh, Lucy will be able to share um, poll A, if you could, Lucy. Um, and this is something for the audience. If you could, um, on the polls tab on the right-hand side, uh, there will be a poll that come up. And if you could just vote for the answer uh, that you feel is best suited for you. Uh, what I would say is that it would be good to just get the farmers' opinions on this. Um, so just farmers only, if you could just answer the um, question that's going to come up in the polls. But going back to you, Duncan, um, obviously you're net zero already. So you're kind of like uh, on the crest of a wave. You're kind of like where I suppose the government want the industry to be uh, by 2045. But I suppose one, something actually, would if you could start by introducing why yeah, you're so far ahead, what's driven that, and then we can potentially talk about um, what you see as barriers or what you found personally to be a barrier when you were going down this road. Yes, uh, thank you very much for having me, Kenneth, and uh, good evening to everyone as well. So a uh, little bit of background. So I'm a leaf farmer. I'm a leaf demonstration farmer. We, we are a combinable crops farm on heavy clay ground in Northamptonshire, and I'm also a food producer, so I was Britain's first uh, grower, bottler, or press and bottler of cold press rated oil under the brand Farrington's Mellow Yellow. And I've been a leaf mark grower for many years. And we have, as part of leaf mark, we have to do lots of uh, daisy collection for fuel use and uh, fertilizer use and various other bits. And um, your, your sort of... Um, quote or comment about carbon isn't everything I'd absolutely agree with because we're we're all about integrated farm management and it's looking at the bigger picture so it's looking at the bits around the edges of the fields the, the hedges the, the birds the bees the butterflies wildflowers clean water air and everything else but as a food brand that wants to be a leading brand um, and the government set these targets for farmers being carbon neutral I thought I'd want to see where where do we sit on this sort of curve? Because I've been doing minimum and zero tillage since 1998, and I've been doing soil tests 
uh, outbreak tests on our fields, which includes the carbon. And I've shown over an 18 year period um, on one field, we've increased our soil organic matter by 76%. And uh, I think David already said it doesn't matter what the figure is, but it's showing where, you know, can can you improve it over time? And Matt's also said that, you know, it does take time to do this. So in 2019, we did a, um, a carbon audit using the leaf figures. And I worked with the UN because then we thought that's a certified figure. And we, we um, with our solar panels and with our zero tillage and with our fuel use and all the other bits and pieces, we actually ended up emitting 350 tonnes of carbon. And we have actually offset that by buying a reforestation into a reforestation project in Uruguay. Now, this is a bit when you talk to farmers, they don't, they, they suddenly, their jaw hits the hip drops and they think, well, wait a minute, because you're sequestering all that carbon, you should be carbon negative. Now, hopefully we are, but at the moment, it's not recognised internationally and it's certainly not recognised by the UN. So uh, leading on from that, we've got our neutrality, but now I'm involved in a European project of, and I'm the British um, case study and it's called Agriculture CO2. And we are working in um, seven different countries around Europe. And what we want to do is using earth observation and soil mapping um, is to actually quantify an internationally acceptable and verify it uh, soil carbon measuring. And from that point, we can start then getting income potentially from regenerative agricultural practices and then also potentially from uh, carbon trading. So um, I can go on a lot more, but I'll, I'll let that, I'll put that, give that back to you, Kenneth, and hopefully you can, we can tease some sort of um, questions out of. Uh, the rest of the panel and um, delegates. So it, it's interesting, and especially when we look at the tools available for measuring um, carbon usage effectively on farm as well. And I think perhaps this would be an opportunity to bring David back in, actually, because I know that um, you've done carbon calculators for your farm as well. Uh, but I was wondering if you could share, David, what what your results found and where you feel that okay, in order to achieve net zero, where you actually need to be reducing uh, your carbon use or emissions? Um, yes, I was just just brushing up on that just now and, and trying to remember the numbers. Uh, so we um, very approximately, we're emitting about a thousand tonnes, I think, uh, from the farm as a whole. But that doesn't include our forestry. If you put our forestry in, of which there's uh, about 900 acres, we then turn into carbon sequesters. But that's cheating slightly because it's not our farming operation. But looking at the numbers uh, in front of me, of the 100% um, of our emissions, 38% is fertiliser, 13% is manure management, and 32%, and this is the one that I struggle with, and we could debate this round in circles all night, is um, enteric fermentation, which is the cattle. Um, and I, I don't know whether the numbers take account of um, the cattle's ability to sequester gra um, carbon into the soil with our grazing management yet, um, and the fact that the the emissions, you know, the methane from the cattle is effectively short-term emission, which turns into CO2 and goes back into the ground eventually through through the grass, in theory. Um, fuel use, funnily enough, is tiny. Fuel and electric is like 8%. Um, so the big one, the big ones are, the one that will affect most farmers will be the livestock and the, and the fertiliser, and the one that will affect everybody, uh, is going to be the fertilizer how do we how do we if we're starting off at 38 percent how do we get that number down um lots there's been lots of suggestion that that you know oh, we just need to up our yields you know another two three tons a hectare and be more efficient at this that and the other but when you're talking about when you see the levels of emissions as a, as a total and we're not we don't use a lot of fertilizer on our crops um we're not very in, hugely intensive in that front um Adding a couple of tons a hectare isn't really going to do it. We're going to have to 
slash usage somehow. Um, and obviously economically that has an impact on our output and we've got to find this balance. Um, a lot of work to be done, I think, on that front from for agriculture. So um, during the whole, during the uh, Arable Scotland this year, there's been talk about integrated pest management and there's also been talk about um, around cover crops and the such like. And then uh, within that conversation, there was touching on, uh, yeah, legumes for nitrogen fixation and things like that. So I suppose uh, we'll start with David. So have you tried, um, have you tried these approaches? And then perhaps we'll go to Duncan as well to see actually whether, whether this approach worked for you. Um, or do you find that offsetting um, through your forestry in um, is a better option? So, David, we we do grow quite a sizable area of, of beans um, on the farm now, um, and yes, we can reduce fertilizer usage as a result of that in the following oat and wheat crops. Um, but it's still not, I don't think it's enough. Um, we have a lot of spring cropping with our spring barley and spring oats. Um, so again, low nitrogen usage. We have we have last year, we grew a field of summer cover crop, um, mixed species cover, and we direct drilled a crop of winter oats into that. Crop looks fantastic. We have used less fertilizer, but we haven't used, we haven't half the fertilizer usage on it yet. We haven't worked that one out. That's something we're going to be looking at doing more. We do have more cover crops in the ground this year. We, we're going to look at doing more of through the strategic farm as time goes on, because it, it, the, in my head, I think that we can we can build the fertility through these crops, but it's how we mine that fertility out so that we're not having to apply so much of the artificial stuff. Um, but then, of course, we have a year where that field is on paper unproductive. So what does that do to the rest of our carbon footprint? Um, Loads, I mean, every every answer we get just opens another door with a heap more questions at the minute, um, I would think. Perhaps, Duncan, you can answer all the questions. Uh... <laughs> no, not at all. I've only, I've only been doing it 25 years and I'm make, making lots of mistakes, but hopefully learning on the way. So we're doing uh, similar things to David. Um, so years ago, I broadened my rotation, which now includes 25% spring cropping, which happens to be barley. So overall effect on the farm rotation is that it's a 13% drop in nitrogen use. And yes, we do do winter beans as well. We can do spring beans, but you can't put your whole farm down to legumes um, because people don't just want legumes and you can't just grow legumes. I do think fertil nitrogen fertilizer, I think it is the big elephant in the room. Um, but there is a lot of research going on there. So maybe Matt Ward might, you know, be able to enlighten us a bit more on sort of nitrates inhibiting additives to make fertilizer use more effective, which we want to try. I'm doing all the cover crops as well. And one field last year, we reduced the nitrogen by 20%, um, but it's still not halving it or getting rid of it. And, and also last year, I tried another field where we undersowed some uh, barley with um, clover, but we did it after the ground frost because everyone said you must do it after a frost, but then it never rained and it never grew. And this year I, I thought, well, forget that. I'm going to put it in when the moisture is good. And of course, we had a load of frost in April and the, the clover is growing, but it is sporadic. And the, the, the idea is that I'm going to then, it's in a crop of spring barley. And if we can, if there's enough clover at harvest, I'm then going to use that as an overwinter cover crop, use some glyphosate to spray off the weeds and then direct drill the following spring wheat or barley into that clover crop um, and not put any nitrogen on. And we'll try that for three or four years in a row. But it's, a, it's, it's risky and it's much easier to go and buy a bag of fertiliser because you know it works and it gives you results. Yeah, Matt, do you want to come in with some comments yeah i mean i think that uh it's right uh duncan's comment about the elephant in the room but what i wouldn't want people to think is that right all i've got to do is now cut my nitrogen because we have to think of carbon in terms of carbon use efficiency in the way that we think of fertile um nutritional use efficiency um and there's no point i think is immoral to think that we should uh, risk carrying lower yields 
because somewhere that crop's got to be grown somewhere. Um, and so we have to be much more um, intelligent about our nitrogen use efficiency. Um, and that is that work is being done by um, lots of uh, academics um, across the country. Um, but our understanding of how the plant uses nitrogen, when and how, um, is pretty poorly understood. Um, and the same with other macro, not even micronutrients. Um, and, you know, just think of Liebrich's barrel. It, you just reduce one element. It doesn't mean to say that you're going to, that's going to solve the problem. Um, so I think, I think there's been alluded to the first point of call is look at rotation. Um, there are some very hungry and very inefficient nitrogen using crops, second cereals um, being a classic example. And there are ways then to look at a rotation to reduce those. There are ways of using technology to identify poorly performing parts of fields and utilising stewardship um, and other schemes to um, take those out of production, but only temporarily, whilst they're in potentially a higher risk situation, a sex and cereal and a subsequent break crop to then return them into a first wheat. Um, and that sort of approach much um, is an approach that we're adopting. And also looking at the technologies around nitrogen, it's not just about ammonium nitrate and can we, um, use ammonium nitrate more efficiently, we will still need to use some, but can we use other um, nitrogen technologies to um, augment that? Um, and there is some evidence that that's possible. Um, so there is lots of things that you can look at, but um, it's an imperfect science that we deal with, isn't it? And um, if, if it were easy, we'd all be doing it. So, um, it's obviously, I think this is the thing, isn't it? We're working in systems, so there isn't one silver bullet that's going to cure absolutely everything, and everything needs to be done together. So, from what you're saying, Matt, and I think we've known it for a while, we need uh, potentially better crop varieties that are more efficient. Um, and also, and certainly from speaking to other people, we still need to optimise these crops to be growing under these different soil management systems, for example, direct drill systems at the moment we're still using um, or largely we're using uh, crop varieties that have been optimized to grow in a plowed field which is potentially some of the reason I'm guessing that's going to be causing these decline in yields initially but then sometimes you're getting an increase in yield um, like you say it's an imperfect um, system that we're actually working in so I suppose um, the other question is so we have a good understanding of where we want to go or we know where we want to go and we have a good understanding of okay where our largest um use of carbon comes from in fertilizer but i suppose if a farmer it what changes do you think can be made today um tomorrow for example that can actually help us down this road so maybe this is one for matt ward actually um to start with uh well, as you alluded to, there's not a silver bullet. So I think the first thing is, um, well, I, what, where I would start is look at my nitrogen use efficiency as it stands now. Uh, understand about how efficient I am at using the nitrogen I'm using already. So grain analysis um, and do a nitrogen budget uh, so that I can then understand where I where I am. on. There's already... A, we use a recommendation system uh, that works on a premise of 60% efficiency. Uh, we know that from yield enhancement network uh, work that we've been involved with, that there are people that are over 85% efficient. Now, if we can move more people towards 85% emission, that's a massive saving in the amount of nutritional use. Um, and uh, that's where we should be trying to move. And that's where the, uh, we should be looking to try and do. You can only do that if you know where your starting position is. Again, it's about measurement. Um, so I, I think if you're looking to do it, then you need to think about 
what's my starting position? Where am I now? So soil measurements um, and then grain measurements um, and that will then allow you to do better nutrient management moving forward. Um, uh, but that will also allow you, you've also then got to think about rotational management, um, technology, how does technology help in that um, nutritional management? You know, there's not one single uh, answer, but, you know, know where you're starting from, surely got to be the starting position. I think this is a very good point as well. It's where we set the baseline or where government or where policy set the baseline in which to potentially uh, be paying um, uh, farm subsidies based on improvement from this baseline. Um, and that's a really important point. And I suppose the question is whether we actually know where this baseline is. Uh, Duncan's obviously has been interested in this many, many years ago before baselining on a, uh, I suppose, on a national level uh, was thought about. Um, which is where it's very, it's very interesting and great to be able to hear of the improvements that you've made, Duncan. Especially when you're talking about increases in soil carbon. Even though we know that soil carbon um, isn't everything, um, there is one question that's come through from Jamie Bartley, um, and this is potentially one for Matt, I think. And I'm not sure if you've seen the question, Matt. Uh, but it's like, what are the panel's thoughts on the best methods for validating the whole carbon cycle? Active, organic, sequestered, and emitted carbon. Um, I, I personally um, would recommend people look at um, organic and active carbon. Uh, I think uh, I would look. I would look at both. Um, I uh, and I, and I think the. Um, uh, think of it in terms of improvement. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not hugely wedded to the idea that uh, if I improve from, if I start at 100 and next year I'm 101, someone is going to pay me for that one improvement, um, because I think that improvement is going to pay for itself. So I'm more poor. I, I think I'm not too worried about the individual validation method about a measurement and then. The a consistency in measurement is what's most important, I think. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll uh, just bring David uh, Aglam back in at this point because I'm actually be interested to hear if the government were to say, "Okay, we're gonna we want to encourage you to change some of your practices." David, obviously, you're a very proactive. You're a uh, AHDB a strategic cereal farm. But what, what would you like um, potentially policy or grants to be able to change on your farm? Technology-wise, is there something that you... Is it not um, need? Is it technology or what? What is it? Personally, for, for me, and us at Balberni Home Farms, it's, it's knowledge, it's education. Is where I think the you know you can if, you can throw money at fancy direct drills or a new GPS system, but the money doesn't stay in the farmer's pocket, and it's hard to, to to benefit the industry from that point of view. But I think from a carbon point of view, I think it's knowledge and education. We've we spend a lot of time reading and listening to people and reading more, and 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 there's just there's so much out there, um, and it's trying to it's trying to tap into it at a level that we can fit into the Scottish climate and, and, and our farming system at the minute. We've, we've uh, gone to huge lengths to try and find species of plant that will grow as a, as a good cover crop throughout the winter um, to, keep, you know, to keep carbon cycling into the soil um, throughout the, the dormant months, certainly for the spring cropping uh, parts of the rotation. And we've really only come up with rye. It's, it's the only one we can really muster, or or, or oats, or, you know, cereals essentially that that'll grow right through the winter and, and do a job for us. Um, so yeah, that that'll be my choice. Re finding cover crop species that are going to grow in our climate without having to take so much land out in the summer potentially, and just education. That there's so much information out there, and getting it collated into a form that we can understand. And we can relate, use it to relate to our own businesses to make progress. Because I think that's where 
certainly we stumbled along the years. You know, we just you try something, it didn't work. You, you only get one shot a year to try it, so you're back to the start of the next year. And I think if we can start getting this going and more people doing it, we can all learn a lot faster. So, yeah, education. Okay, and is that something that you felt was the challenge at the beginning? I know you touched on that when you were talking, Duncan, about how you started out. Um, did you find it difficult to, at the beginning, to get the information you needed? Was it in the wrong format, or was there just not a general repository or a one-stop shop? And maybe there isn't now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we 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 have we we can grow good black grass here. So one of my things was. Um, trying to not move the soil so much to um, control black grass. And to start with, uh, we had all sorts of trouble with drainage and compaction and black grass. And, and you know, neighbours were laughing at what I was doing, but now neighbours are doing pretty similar and trying all things out. And it is about education and communication. So, you know, whether it is um, on the fertiliser reduction, there could be some huge progress with um, bio-cropping, you know, planting uh, two different crops together. Um, it could be with biostimulants or um, compost teas, as someone calls, some people call them. Um, or it could be, um, you know, in the future, it could be rhizobia that we could add in with the seed or on foliar feeds. So there's a lot. Of, we need um, science, we need education, and we need communication because at the moment, traditional farming methods work. They produce crops. And, and remember, nitrogen's taken us for over... A, the last 150 years from a world population of something like one and a half billion up to seven and a half billion and to go backwards um is is a it's not an answer for producing food on a sustainable for a sustainable planet and population um but by as david said having one shot a year and making mistakes isn't the best way to try and sell the whole concept to others to take on we need we need some solid research and some solid answers that we can pick and mix and and take on board yeah thank you and i suppose that's something that um the research community needs to get better at as well potentially as well um just um there's a, a few more questions starting to come in now so um one has come from royal nation Real Roy Nielsen, and he said, as it was mentioned earlier, that soil C is a fuel for soil biota. Um, does the panel think, are there any measures that soil biota um, consider appropriate as a proxy measure uh, for soil carbon? Duncan's nodding his head. Does that mean Duncan? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, no uh, um, so, uh, what have I got here? It's, it's a muddy graph. I can't, I don't know. Can you see that? Is two lines on a the graph. They're going uphill. Um, and it doesn't matter what the figures are, but one of them is the carbon and the other one is the cation exchange capacity. And, and Matt Aikenhead will answer this far better than I would. I'm not a soil scientist, but basically the more the bigger the cation exchange capacity, the bigger the dinner plate is. So the more nutrition you can get on your plate, if you think of the soil. So um, by increasing on our fields, by increasing the carbon, we have increased the overall nutrition of the soil just by it's more biologically active, um, whether it's roots, whether it's biology, um, little creatures down there helping to get more readily available phosphate, for example, which then can help the plant grow. So you're not having to put that on. So, yeah, car carbon isn't everything, but car you know they, they go hand in hand. And again, if you can increase the nutrition of your soil, you can put you can grow the crops and animals with less inputs. And also, at the end of the day, we should be providing more nutritionally dense food to the consumers, which is good for the whole society, I'd argue. I think this is one of the things, actually, that's involved in the whole debate about achieving net zero is also the role of society, the wider society, in contributing to this uh, by, by consuming a less carbon-rich diet. Um, but that's possibly not for this discussion here. Um, Matt Ward, or actually Matt Aikenhead, do you want to make any further comment on that, what Duncan was saying about cation exchange capacity, um, soil carbon and soil biota? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think Duncan made a really good point there. And one of the things he was saying was the access to the nutrition for the soil biota and for the plants. So the cation exchange capacity, yes, that's, that is an important uh, component to that. Another thing that I would say is really important is the, the physical structure of the soil. 
So the, that, that is a strong indicator of the condition that the soil is in um, and how easy it's going to be simply for the water to move through the soil or for roots to be able to penetrate the soil or, or to get access to the nutrients. So you all know if you've, if you've got a really thick, dense, compacted soil, it's going to have a lot of problems along those areas. So achieving a good soil structure, obviously there are management implications with how you manage to do that and things that you you know you should or shouldn't do. Things around you know, the ploughing and wet conditions, things like that. And and so that, that is a really important thing. There was another thing that I thought was, was quite important, which was in terms of needing more information and being able to actually support the farmers um, when they're at, when they're trying out new things. So, Duncan, when you said you, you've been at this for 25 years and you had a lot of problems at the start, you were taking a massive risk at the start because you were, you were going into, into unexplored territory. And that's that risk needs to be supported in some way. So there's, there's a whole perennial debate that's been going on in terms of farm support in terms of payment for results versus payment for actions. And what we're seeing commonly is that policymakers tend to go towards payment for results. They want to see a result, they want to know that it works, and then they'll pay for it. But that doesn't provide support to the farmers when they're actually taking those risks, because a lot of the time, the thing that you're trying to do might be fairly well scientifically tested, but it's not been tested on your farm. So there's still an element of uncertainty, still an element of it might not work. And so the support for farmers in stepping into the unknown and actually trying these things out, that feels to me like it's lacking. And without that support, it's going to be very hard to actually convince land managers that they should, they should take these steps and, and try these things and go for it. So, yeah, there's, there's a whole debate there. It's a very good point, isn't it? It's covering the, it, yeah, it's making sure the farmers are not losing out by trying something different. And that's a thing that I think needs to be addressed. And especially if it's a, um, yeah, it depends on the size of the farm as well. So obviously, yeah, a smaller field of a larger farm is going to be um, less of a risk than a, a larger field of a smaller farm, so to speak, um, which I suppose is something that needs to be equaled out. Um Paul has put an interesting question up there. Actually, I'll go to Doug Christie, who had a question. Um, it's quite an interesting one, actually. So does the panel know whether organic farms perform better than conventional farms on the carbon front? Now, surely they must do, but I don't know if anyone, um, is anyone able to comment on any knowledge that they have on their performance? Uh, so my limited understanding... I'll unmute Matt Ward. There you go, Matt. Sorry. Sorry, thank you, Ken. Uh, my limited understanding is that it depends what you measure. And if you measure the sequestration, it's better, emissions are better, but the actual um, use efficiency, so the footprint of an individual tonne of produce, is not very different because they're lower yields. Okay, so th that's quite, um, yeah, okay, that's quite interesting. Um, there's another question that's come in from Paul. Now, Paul Hargreaves um, is one of our, we'll call him a super panel or a super audience member who has the capability of sharing his audio um, and video. So perhaps, Paul, you want to um, maybe expand a little bit on the question you've got there or, or maybe put some context around it? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for uh, introducing us. Uh, yeah. um, I've never oh. thought of myself as a super... <laughs> Super panel member, but uh, no, I'm just. Uh, I mean, it's a very interesting discussion here, and it's come, uh, touched on a number of uh, things. But uh, I think it's just coming back to this: what do you monitor? How do you monitor it? And this kind of fixation of year one has got to be worse or better than year five, and not really thinking about. Uh, the advantages of things within a rotation. So if you do have, say, beans in your rotation, the yields might not, or the, the profit from there, or the yields might be questionable in that in a certain year. You're not maximising your profit for that particular year from whatever your yields you get. However, you're getting advantages for the year afterwards. 
and potentially the year after that with enhanced soil quality, potentially reduced nitrogen inputs. And so is it worth looking at one particular year against another one or is it better to look at the whole rotation and say this is improving through time? Okay, uh, do any of the other panel members want to um, make any comment on what Paul's just said there? Uh, uh, Duncan, if you'd... Uh, uh, sorry, David. Oh, Duncan first and then David, yeah. Yeah, certainly you, you should... It, carbon should be looked at throughout the rotation and it's not... It's um, and my graph alone. Um, I had one year it went up ever so high and the next year it went down and that was um, just purely down to the person that took the samples and that's me because it's me that's done it every year and we can cheat the system as well by the depth we take the sample from um so this is why the agriculture co2 project we're working with we're trying to get so that there is internationally accepted on what the metrics are and how you test it and and yes you can cheat it for one year you can cheat it for two or three years and also when your soil gets to a decent carbon level you get then get carbon cycling so the soil will naturally emit carbon so you have to you know but it's all part of a, a healthy soil is going to emit carbon because the, the the bacteria in there are breaking things down and respiring so you might um, actually reduce carbon but increase methane if you get uh, compaction issues so uh don't look at it in isolation and certainly don't take don't be worried about whatever your figure is on any particular field in one year, I'd say. It's over the long term. Okay, and David. Uh, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly with what Duncan's been saying. Um, it goes back to my comment at the very start about you know carbon and money. You can look at them in the, in the same view. Um, as a, a, good, a good sensible rotation... Um, is you, you're going to have years where you've got poor performing crops and and years where you've got really good performing crops, um, and it's the same with the carbon. It's a long term building process. It's not it's not like you can you can get a percent every year. Some years you go up, some years you, you go down. Uh, um, so yeah, it, it has to be. I think how you how you monetize that or or get funding towards that I don't know because of course everything's done year to year at the minute um, I don't that's it's a fair challenge there um, but yeah definitely it's a long term thing and and you won't necessarily see the benefits for three or four or five years and then the cycling starts going better you, you're getting nutrients cycling around your soil <coughs> excuse me much better and then you know everything clicks into place and all of a sudden things start to work which you've been struggling with for a few years previously perhaps um, so yeah Thank you. And back to the um, topic of the conversation. So obviously we covered a lot of ways in which we can make carbon pay, be that by um, having improved soil quality through increased soil carbon uh, to reducing fertiliser use and therefore saving money uh, on inputs. Um, I'd just like to bring it round a little bit to the drivers of going. Obviously, we have emissions targets to hit but also how these can be, I suppose, uh, certification programs. So obviously, Duncan's heavily involved with LEAF, so linking environment and farming and accreditation um, schemes. But I'd be interested to hear um, what people's thoughts are of accreditation or farm certification um, in moving towards net zero. Is there something that these schemes should or shouldn't be doing, in your opinions, um, going forward? So I suppose um, it's a question for Duncan, really. Do you, um, yeah, what's the, yeah, I, I suppose I've said my piece. So uh, you can come back with saying, yeah, uh, accreditation things are the be all and end, end all of everything and they should be driving change in the industry or no, they should stay out of um, trying to drive industry and let the politicians do that. I, I certainly wouldn't leave it to the politicians because, uh, uh, you um, one thing I, I, I do say, because as farmers, we all want it to be commercially. It wants to work, doesn't it? So we need it to, to stack up commercially and get results. And and as uh, Matt kindly said, you know, I have taken risks and I've made mistakes. And commercially, that's not always great. But I've, I've, um, another thing I'd always say is look at yourself in the mirror and look at the next generation, because we are at this sort of tipping point of climate change. And agriculture and forestry or land management is about the only industry in the world 
that can um, actively absorb carbon and carbon dioxide. So um, does the, um, uh, what about accreditations? Obviously, I think LEAF's wonderful. The good thing about LEAF, it is independent and you're independently audited. And it is tough. You do have to jump, jump through hoops. And a lot of the hoops you have to jump through are meeting the UN um, Millennium Goals. And then moving on from that, LEAF are in all, um, involved in the agriculture CO2 project. And how do we get paid? It's not necessarily, or how will we get paid? It won't necessarily just be for trading the carbon, but it's actually doing the regenerative agricultural practices. And this is what Matt was saying. That will take some of the risk out of the farmers doing it. And that's why they, we want to use earth observation um, and use soil analysis so that even if in year one, two and three you don't get improved carbon and on a sandy soil growing high value vegetable produce, it might be more of your income coming from selling that rather than trading carbon. But if you can farm with the regenerative practices, you can get a second income either from government or I'm more excited if we can get it from those big financial institutions and, and, and the dirty industries, whether it's car manufacturing or what have you, that are desperate to offset their carbon emissions. And as an industry, we have an opportunity to offer them a solution. But it needs to be, I keep saying internationally certified and verified, because if it isn't and people start doing private deals, my worry is that um, you might, it's like signing up to the wrong mobile phone contract and you've signed up for something for five or 10 years that you can't get out of and you've sold it at the wrong price. So um, there's lots of questions to be answered, but I think working with an audit organisation that is trusted throughout the industry and at government level is, is a, good, a very good place to start. I think that's a very good thing, isn't it? it that's a very good point. Of we know, whoever's doing the audit, they need to be trusted and they need to be um, set. Uh, they should be adhering to a particular standard. So we know that all audits are the same, um, irrespective of the uh, certification organisation, so to speak. Um, David, I don't know if you want to add anything about farm certification schemes to what Duncan said. Um, another scheme, yes. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think as Doug said, it's 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 a big opportunity for the industry. I would really like to see the industry uh, keeping hold of this rather than farming it out to too many third parties, and and it, we just become um, puppets in a or pawns in a game of trading carbon to make big conglomerates look green and and good for the planet. We. We need to keep hold of this and keep ownership of this uh, from start to finish because only we really can control within the bounds of nature and what we do on the farm how much how well we can we can sequester carbon and I suppose the first thing we need to decide is how we're going to measure it I don't think that's been settled yet so we've we've an awful long way to go but it, it does potentially look good it's got good prospects in the future I would say. I think it's a very interesting point as well about how we actually measure it as well. So obviously we talked about the temporal variability, so the variability over time of monitoring carbon, the effect of sampling strategy, um, as in how deep you go as to what it's going to affect, affect your carbon measurement. But there's even just the fundamental things like methodology. So Duncan was talking about remote sensing. So obviously there's been work looking at measuring soil carbon through remote sensing, or it's certainly at the very initial stages, but... I suppose the question is, is, is finding reliable methods to be goes back to the very basics of finding the good fundamental measures to get this baseline in the first place, place that we know we can use robustly going forward. Um, unfortunately, we're now coming towards the end of the conversation. Uh, so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, David Aglan, uh, Matt Ward, Matt Aikenhead uh, and Duncan Farrington uh, for their um insightful experiences and knowledge um, in this conversation as well. I'd also like to say uh, thank you to Alison Milne, who, um, although hasn't been able to join us in the conversation, she did successfully use Hopin at every um, pre-meeting we had to make sure it all worked and everything. So there is an irony in that, that the more you prepare, um, uh, it, <laughs> in some case, it just seems to have failed, which is very um disappointing but we appreciate your um 
efforts, Alison. Um, in the conversation, we've we've covered quite a lot of different topics. So how you can change your on farm behaviour, what the barriers are potentially going to be in the future, and key to this is um, basically reduce, reducing fertiliser use or finding um, that seems to be the main way to be reducing um, carbon on farm. Um, so we can go round if there's if anyone would like to give an inspirational. Um, speech or a G up to say, okay, we can get there. We have, we have the knowledge. We have the technology. Uh, we just need to dig deep and look at the end goal. So, David, you're smiling at that, which either means you agree or you're thinking, okay, I, there are too many unanswered questions at the moment. I think I think we can do it. Whether we can do it in the time frame might be set out by government um, or the marketplace uh, that's the bit that concerns me there, there seems to be too much of a rush and people have been looking at carbon for years and years and years and we still don't have the answers so are we going to have the answers in 2024 when the uh, subsidy system changes in Scotland I don't know that's my only concern but yeah I think we can achieve it but when I don't know OK, and I think we also, the key thing is to be realistic as well. And I think it, it's important to be having these conversations rather than just thinking, OK, we're going to be aiming for this and just assume that we're going to reach it. But if the reality is we might not, then we need to start talking about why and then tackling those particular issues. So, Matt Ward, I don't know if you want to say anything from an agronomist perspective of saying, actually, do you know what? We could um, do it tomorrow. Don't go and buy a new drill. No. Um, Matt's on yeah. mute, so it either means... Okay, Matt, on you go. Okay, um, don't go and buy a new drill uh, before you understand where you're starting from. Do some measurement first, both around soil and nutrient use, um, and then decide where you want to go. Perfect. And I suppose the last word can go to Duncan. So obviously Duncan's there already. Um, what advice would you like to give to um, everyone in the audience? Um, be positive. Um, agriculture and farmers, we have the chance to be uh, carbon superheroes. So just go for it. Don't wait for the government or anyone else. Start playing around now in a little way. Measure. And then also just go and have a look at agriculturecoeu and join on the journey with us. Because when we do get there, not necessarily carbon credits, but on the whole regenerative project, um, we will be looking at back payments for three to five years and they will be UN certified payments. So, you know, there's a lot of work going on around there and it'll be great to get um, people on that journey now. Perfect. Literally, with probably seconds to spare, we've reached seven o'clock. So thank you very much to the panel again. And thank you to everyone um, on behalf of the organisers um, and also the supporters of Arable Scotland 2021 uh, for engaging uh, throughout the day.